Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this panel on the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, thank you for spending the time and attending this afternoon. Um, it's an important time for the BWC this year. We had the um, celebration for the 40th anniversary of the Biological Weapons Convention in Geneva and around the world earlier this year, back in March. And obviously next year we have, as the title of this, present, of this session implies, we have the 8th Review Conference next November in Geneva. If we look at the agenda for this conference, we've already had discussion or discussions on bio issues in the previous session, the one which took place just before the coffee break on new technologies and challenges for non-proliferation and disarmament. And it looks like bio issues will also come up in a session tomorrow, I think tomorrow after lunchtime on CBRN, lessons learned from Fukushima, Ebola and Syria. And this session fits into that kind of sequence by focusing mainly on the diplomatic activities surrounding preparations for the review conference next year. Um, as head of the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention in Geneva, um, I am obviously very happy to have been asked to chair this panel. I'm looking forward and I will listen with great interest to, um, well, to both what we hear from the, the three panelists that we have here, but also from your questions and comments from the audience afterwards as well. Um, I'm not going to speak for long myself now. I will soon hand over to the panelists. Um, each of them will have 10 minutes um, to speak. Hopefully that will give us plenty of time for questions and answers and discussion from, from the floor, from the audience afterwards. And we'll hear from each of them sequentially, and then we'll take questions and comments after, each, um, after all three presentations. Um, I've been asked also to remind you all that this is on the record and it's being um, recorded as well. Um, in discussion with the panelists, we've agreed that Ambassador Khan will speak first. He will kick us off, um, followed by Una Becker Jacob, and then finishing off with um, John Hart. And we'll take them in that sequence. The biographies of each of the panelists are on the um, conference app, so I won't provide detailed introductions now. And first of all, then, I would like to introduce Ambassador Khan. He's currently Director General of the Institute for Strategic Studies in Islamabad. Um, but of most, um, I guess, direct relevance to us here on this particular topic, Ambassador Khan was the president of the sixth review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention in 2006. So, Ambassador Khan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll stick to the basics, basically. Uh, first, what is the purpose of a... Uh, uh, review conference. It's captured in Article 12. The purpose of the RevCons is to review the operation of the BWC and relevant scientific and technological developments. L we mustn't forget the big picture. The big picture is that uh, we have to recognize that the Biological Weapons Convention in the last 40 years has made the world a safer place and it has contributed considerably to multilateralism and disarmament. There's a broad agreement that the life sciences will be used only for benign purposes and that we will continue to fight present and future threats of their destructive use, biological warfare, and bioterrorism. It has also built a robust norm. The convention has eliminated an entire class of weapons of mass destruction. It's a very simple treaty, but it has many shortcomings. Over the decades, it has built a robust norm against the repugnant notion of using disease as a means of warfare. Though membership of the BWC is not yet universal, no state claims today that biological weapons are a legitimate means of national defense. The BWC is by far the most successful WMD non-proliferation and disarmament regime. As far as the review conference is concerned, it all boils down to leadership and consensus building. There is historical baggage. We know about it. Um, I understand the political differences are once again creeping up and there appears to be a reluctance to work together constructively. This is most unfortunate. 
we should stem the strift before the rev come. And we must generate the requisite political will to resolve divisive issues, or more pragmatically, to work around them in the collective interest of strengthening the BWC regime. We should try to explore not the lowest common denominator, but a common denominator reflecting the best interests of all. There's also a dark strategic overhang uh, as we proceed to the next review conference. This is the differences between the United States and Russian Federation. In Ukraine, in Syria, in the context of the Nuclear Security Summit, and they should not shadow the review conference. To achieve that objective, we need to start informal and wide-ranging consultations with all stakeholders to focus on areas that could command consensus. I understand from Daniel Feeks that uh, a cross-regional approach is gaining momentum. I will not go into the details. Now let me talk about the challenges. There's been a fundamental shift in the way the BWC has taken place over the past 15 years. Widespread recognition, there's widespread recognition that biological weapons are just one part of the spectrum of biological risks, such as naturally occurring disease, laboratory accidents, and so on. This spectrum of risk must be dealt with in an integrated and coordinated way. We have succeeded, but we can't just sit on our laurels. Biological science and technology are developing at a very rapid speed. The global security situation is evolving in unpredictable and alarming ways. Asymmetric warfare, terrorism, and violent extremism have multiplied security risks and threats in many parts of the world. The BWC community must respond to all these challenges effectively. We should continue to invest in preparedness and response to avert and manage an unforeseen hostile outbreak of disease. We should overcome reluctance to explore new ideas that might help deal with contentious issues such as compliance verification and Article 10. We should now tackle some of our historical problems with an open mind and renewed entrepreneurial spirit. Verification. The treaty in, self, in itself would not be sufficient to erect barriers against the biological weapons. The lack of verification provisions, coupled with suspicions of deception and cheating, and concerns about the implications of scientific and technological advances, have led states, states parties, to begin discussing how the convention might be strengthened. The, this debate is fundamental to the success of the treaty and the forthcoming REVCON. There is a Russian proposal on the table. Uh, it talks about strengthening the convention uh, to be included, and of course there is the usual caveat, as appropriate in a legally binding instrument to be submitted for the consideration of the state's parties. Now if you look at the proposed mandate, it covers pretty much everything, confidence building and transparency measures and national implementation and monitoring developments in areas of science and technology. And it talks about international cooperation for peaceful purposes in accordance with Article 10 and assistance and protection against biological weapons in accordance with Article 7 and a mechanism for investigating alleged use of biological weapons. Now, <clears throat> for some, this is too modest. For others, it's a diversion. And this is not my assessment or my formulation. This is Daniel Feek's uh, assessment that he's shared me uh, through an email. There's also the area of cybersecurity. Uh, biological sciences increasing dependence on information technologies makes cybersecurity a growing risk, and thus a threat to BWC objectives. 
BWC should be used as a model for regulating dual-use cyber technologies because the treaty attempts to advance scientific progress while preventing its exploitation for hostile purposes. Let me move on to ISU, Implementation Support Unit. Its agenda is quite heavy. Um, the six responsibilities which have been listed, which is administrative support and assistance, national implementation support and assistance, support and assistance for CBMs, support and assistance for obtaining universality. It also administers the database for assistance requests and offers and facilitates associated exchanges of information and supports states' parties' efforts to implement the decisions and recommendations of the review conference. This is quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> all states' parties agree that uh, the Implementation Support Unit has demonstrated extraordinary performance in the past several years. It's high time that ISU is expanded. It should not remain a poor relative of the NPT and CWC. Both of them have very muscular... Two minutes? I've already wasted 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> then there's uh, bioterrorism. There's a growing risk that biological weapons may be obtained and used by non-state actors. Uh, new allegations have, been, have surfaced that tens of billions of dollars are being invested into bioweapons laboratories. I don't want to elaborate that point. There's, of course, let me skip, the universalization. Today, states' parties' number stands at 173, and nine, there are nine signatory states. The point that I want to make here is that in the run-up to the BWC review conference, the ISU and the president-designate can really accelerate the process. And uh, this is a golden opportunity to expedite the process. Another point that I want to make is that we need to build on the synergies between the BWC, OPCW, the United Nations, WHO, FAO, and OIE. While other matters are being sorted out and differences grow, I think that four things can be done, and I want to list. One is strengthen implementation and build mutual confidence on compliance by strengthening, streamlining, updating, and refining legislative, administrative, and security and safety measures, and disseminating information about what member states are doing. Second is build national and international capacities Third, encourage investment in preparedness and response, and enhance dialogue with bioscientific, academic research, and business community to keep track of the benign and malign uses of biosciences in order to prepare well for the emergencies and make best use of the breakthroughs in biotechnology. I'm going to wind up. Don't worry. The... <clears throat> My conclusion, the international community should remain vigilant and prepared to deal with the threats of bioterrorism, as well as deliberate or accidental releases. We must, this is a quote, we must come together to prevent, detect, and fight every kind of biological danger, whether it is a pandemic like N1H1, a terrorist threat, or a treatable disease. President Barack Obama, United Nations General Assembly, September the 22nd, 2011. I selected this quote because this pretty much says it all. Last, again, I think, uh, attribution to Daniel Peaks, and we had an exchange of email, and he, he said that, and I, I wanted to capture it and highlight it, that the BWC should remain a living treaty. It should not lose relevance, and it should reinvent itself and refire itself. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's a really good way to, to kick off this panel. Thank you. Um, like I said, we'll take questions at the, at the end after all, three, after all three presentations. So I would now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Una Becker-Jakob, 
a research associate at the Peace Research Institute, Frankfurt. Una, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. I'm, I'm very glad to be here today and have the opportunity to speak to you um, about the, the upcoming BWC review conference. My presentation is based on, on a few assumptions that I'd like to share with you, and that's namely that the BWC is an important disarmament treaty, that it is working quite well as a treaty, but that there is room for improvement in terms of its operation. And, um, at least I hope there is, a sufficient number of states willing to work on such improvements. Of course, the most suitable venue that we currently have for such work is the upcoming review conference, and this is why we're discussing this here today. So in my presentation, I would like to address just two of many, many possible ways in which the eighth review conference might take the BWC forward. The first, and maybe to some not the most obvious one, is through the final declaration. And the second I would like to address is in the area of compliance, and we've heard a little bit about that already. But first on the final declaration, um, as we all know, the review of the operation of the convention, which is sort of the, the, the function of the review conference, um, is partly to help enhance the treaty's effectiveness, provide a forum to agree, review, and possibly improve additional measures to that end, and also to reaffirm old and record new shared understandings of the treaty's core norms and of their interpretations. Um, and this also includes any new common understandings that might have been formed out of the intersessional interactions that, as I guess you all know, we've had over the past few years. Um, these new common understandings, if there are some, uh, they could also be recorded in the final declaration. The final declaration is part of the final document of, or, or has been part of the final documents of all review conferences, almost all, all but one. Um, so though it might sound a little academic at first to talk about the final declaration in this way, um, these declarations actually are more than just words on paper, and they do have consequences and a certain function. And this is why I believe that the final declaration um, deserves good attention already in the preparation process. At previous review conferences, um, states' parties have, for example, prepared language proposals uh, for inclusion in the final declaration well before the conference. Um, so there was some basis for discussion already at the conference. Uh, for instance, in 2006, uh, the EU members sh shared between them all B BWC articles and prepared um, elements for all articles. Other states' parties have done the same back in 2006 and also in 2011, uh, which the EU didn't do then. Uh, and I think similar preparations might be helpful for the conference uh, next year, too. But important as I think it is, the final declaration is, of course, only one possible outcome of the conference. Um, and other topics will have to be discussed and hopefully decided upon. As we've heard before, states' parties will have to consider the future of the ISU, since its mandate will expire next year. There might be some work left over from 2011 to do on CBMs, on the confidence building measures that are part of the BWC regime. And then other agenda items from the last intersessional process will have to be considered in one way or another. And that's, uh, that includes cooperation under Article 10, assistance under Article 7, national implementation, and, of course, scientific and technological developments that are relevant to the BWC. So there's quite a lot to work on. States' parties will also have to think about new intersessional meetings, so whether there should be any, and if there should, in which format they should take place, and which topics they should cover. And I expect from previous experiences and current discussions that that will also keep states' parties quite busy. There would be much to say on every single of these topics, but rather than doing that and probably going well beyond my time limit, I would like to focus on another topic which has not been on the agenda for a while, but has been mentioned in your presentation just now, and that's compliance. I certainly don't want to go into the history of the verification compliance deadlock in the BWC, but just to remind everyone briefly, the last time compliance was an official topic at a review conference was in 2001. Um, and that was in connection with the question of a verification system. It was not formally mentioned at the review conference in 2006, and there were some unsuccessful attempts to reintroduce it in 2011, 
but the principled opposition persisted and still persists between those who prefer a legally binding instrument to strengthen the BWC and those who reject this approach. Um, so this debate does not seem to be going anywhere, so it, though it might be re uh, revived through the Russian proposal that you just mentioned, and I won't go into detail of that again. A number of states have also expressed interest in discussing compliance on a more conceptual level, so discuss what it actually means for the BWC or where we could go with that concept, uh, and also in considering more practical steps towards enhanced assurance of compliance, but other than in the traditional notions of verification. Ideas have been circulated how states' parties could improve national implementation of the BWC and through this demonstrate their compliance with and their commitment to the convention. And I'm referring here to a French proposal of a peer review process of national implementation and to a concept that um, was originally proposed by Canada and then joined by other states on the assessment of national implementation programs. Um, I believe John will say something about them too, so I'll leave it at that now. So we might see a potential climate of demonstrating commitment and providing reassurance of compliance and in that, there might be a trend towards reporting and more reporting. We have that through the confidence building measures already. We have it on national implementation, on implementation of Article 10. We might get more, hopefully, on transparency steps such as visits to facilities and also on other initiatives that exist now or might be brought up in the future. So if this trend continues and is supported by more and more states, which I think would be a good thing, there is a chance of more transparency, of more information available, and of more reassurance. But there's also a risk of less clarity, just due to the sheer amount of information that we can get in various places and formats. So what could the Eighth Review Conference do about this? One possibility might be to decide to make better use of the compliance reports. And since not everyone here might be familiar with these reports, which is a telling fact in itself, probably, let me just briefly explain what they are. Ever since the first review conference, the PrepComs have requested the Secretariat, or now the ISU, to compile reports on states' parties' compliance. And these reports were based on submissions by states' parties, but there were no formal requirements as to the structure of the reports or what they should cover. That was up to the states' parties entirely. Participation rates have been low, uh, with an all-time high, and let me emphasize high, of 36 contributions in 2011, and that was at a time when the BWC had 165 members and 103 states parties were registered as conference participants, um, and we had 36 submissions. So how could these reports play a more useful role in enhancing confidence and compliance? In their present form, they probably couldn't. But states' parties could make an effort to enhance their role in the regime. And everybody who's familiar with BWC review conferences will know that um, even such a very modest proposal, I think it's a modest proposal, might be difficult. Um, but I still would like to suggest some short-term goals that maybe could be goals for the next conference already. Um, states parties could think of including in the final document a call on, state, on states parties to submit compliance reports other than just have the PrepCOMS request a report that would raise the status of the reports. Um, it would be nice to change the interval maybe and to make it shorter than five years. States parties could discuss and possibly agree on a common format for the compliance reports. Um, I think a structure would be, would be helpful that is flexible enough to cover all prohibitions and obligations that arise from the BWC, um, as well as that could integrate any reports on additional activities. So I'm not thinking of something very rigid, but rather just a framework that could cover all the reporting that is going on, plus the compliance reports. Um, so reports on transparency initiatives, on peer reviews, on compliance assessments, and anything else that might come up could be integrated. And probably the most difficult of the three, it would be helpful to have some kind of forum in a new intersessional process or in any format that could be agreed upon uh, to discuss further steps, follow-up procedures for analysis and clarification, 
ways to fully integrate existing initiatives, maximizing their utility, or any other ideas that are connected with compliance. Such more coherent compliance reports alone would be nice to have, I think, but probably they wouldn't do too much to really assure states parties of each other's compliance because there's st they'd still be unilateral reports. So much more work lies ahead. Um, but I think embedded in a mix of other procedures, uh, such reports still might be a useful tool and might be a building block in an approach that states parties might hopefully will pursue um, regarding compliance. So to conclude, um, the final declaration that I mentioned and compliance are, of course, just two of many important issues with which the review conference will have to concern itself. Um, but I think they're important because the final declaration helps preserve the norms against biological weapons and biological warfare. And as we've heard before, currently the norms are strong and solid, but it's still important to, to keep it that way. Um, and the whole area of compliance is one, I think, which, if it was acted upon, might make the BWC more effective in its very core function that I still see um, in biological disarmament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Una. And um, finally, I would like to introduce John Hart, who is Senior Researcher and Head of the Chemical and Biological Security Project at CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. John, over to you. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers and say that I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this meeting. Numerous planning documents and policy statements are being generated in the lead up to the eighth review conference of the 1972 Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. Facilitators will consult with capitals to discuss and clarify understandings of what constitutes a successful review conference. This process can then inform the drafting of a review conference agenda and to help support the work of an open-ended working group or committee of the whole. Such a process typically results in draft decision language and a draft agenda for the consideration and possible modification and adoption by the review conference. The facilitator or facilitators and other involved officials will also obtain a better understanding of how the concerns, understandings, and priorities of capitals can be taken into proper account, namely to support constructive interaction and outcomes. Criteria for a successful outcome might include attempting to ensure that, one, the principle of not harming the regime, perhaps inadvertently, is observed, two, preparations are well managed, for example, through constructive consultation among the relevant actors and the timely availability of documentation, and three, the review conference outcome maintains and strengthens the relevance perceived and actual of the regime, including to the broader public, international actors, and government communities. Notable developments in the current intersessional process include discussions and papers under the rubric of Let's Discuss Compliance and a joint Belgium-Luxembourg-Netherlands peer review system to assess national implementation of the convention based, in turn, on a December 2013 pilot peer review exercise hosted by France and involving the participation of experts from Canada, China, Germany, India, Mexico, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The Benelux peer review proposal is currently being implemented in two phases. One is a written consultation based on a 2015 CBM submissions, Forms A and E, I believe. And the second is an event in which this information is discussed, which is then followed by on-site visits to, quote, installations declared in form A of the host company, uh, country, unquote. In 2014, the Russian Federation tabled a proposal at the meeting of experts, which called for reconsideration of compliance issues. This proposal was based partly on work carried out in the early 1990s by the ad hoc group of governmental experts to identify and examine potential verification measures from a scientific and technical standpoint, otherwise known as VIRIX. The Russian Federation suggested renewing discussions on a legally binding protocol to strengthen compliance with the Convention. More specifically, such discussions could, the Russian Federation suggested, cover seven thematic areas. One is the investigation of alleged use. Two, investigation of suspicious disease outbreaks. Three, promoting international cooperation for peaceful purposes. Four, 
assistance and protection against biological weapons, five, CBMs, existing or modified, six, national implementation, and seven, science and technology developments. Verification of facilities suspected to be in breach of the convention were not included in this proposal. This proposal has generated some positive reaction, including among delegations from the Non-Aligned Movement Caucus and a number of Western group states. The Implementation Support Unit has worked to establish a database with offers and requests for assistance in accordance with a decision by the Seventh Review Conference in 2011. In November 2012, only 11 offers of assistance had been made, all by one party, while another party had made a single request for assistance. In addition, no matches of offers or requests had been communicated to the ISU as of late 2012. In 2013, the Non-Aligned Movement Group observed that the full implementation of an ISU database remained to be achieved. As of August 2015, the Article 10 database had 29 offers, including one by the Australia Group to collectively assist on strategic trade controls, and four requests from three states' parties. In August 2015, France and India tabled a joint proposal for an Article 7 uh, database, which basically means uh, capacity for detecting, reporting, and responding to outbreaks of infectious diseases or biological weapons attacks. If the state's parties wish to agree a further intercessional process for 2017 through 2020, a short list of operational activities could be developed that are mainly focused on Article 1 and Article 10 as a basis for consultations with capitals and other relevant actors. Such consultations could be structured according to one, a general discussion and exchange of views reviewing basic questions such as, what is the state of the treaty regime? What are the preferred review conference outcomes? What political cross linkages are known or likely? Are such linkages constructive and how can they be managed? Two, the balance and nature of review conference outcomes uh, for example, the balance between process or capacity-oriented activity versus specific outcomes that more closely accord to standard understandings of a decision. And finally, three, exploration of the feasibility of focusing the planning process on two to three operationally relevant activities that are most, um, well, let's say, mostly directed towards Article 1 and Article 10. The results could then be presented so as to facilitate prioritization and analysis. There's been periodic interaction among actors having responsibility for supporting the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention, respectively. Both treaties cover toxins. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, including the Scientific Advisory Board, continue to monitor changes in the chemical industry that involve the use of biological and biologically mediated processes, as well as the modalities for how such developments can or should be incorporated into the treaty's routine declaration and verification system. In 2015, the Director General of the OPCW outlined actions to implement the recommendations made by the Scientific Advisory Board in its latest report on verification. While the science and technology developments highlighted by the Scientific Advisory Board are less relevant to the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention regime, a number of the implementation strategies, some of which are process-oriented, as well as principles for measuring outcomes and results, could serve as a useful basis for informal consultations in the lead-up to the review conference. So this could be done, for example, in the context of sampling and analysis best practices, nomenclature standards, and peer-reviewed consultative strategies directly relevant to CBMs. It could also be useful to consider the appropriateness and desirability for the ISU to host or act as a point of contact on a temporary basis, a limited and focused number of biosecurity or biosafety action lines, similar to those implemented by the European Commission's Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development, DG DEVCO, under the instrument contributing for stability and peace. I hope this is a useful basis for discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, John, thank you very much. Thank you for sticking to time. Thank you to all participants, in fact, for sticking to time, which gives us a lot of time now for questions, for comments from the audience. I can already see some, some hands raised in anticipation of being a <laughs> asking questions. I will think the best thing to do is that we take a few questions.
questions at a time and then let the, the members of the panel answer them, if that's okay. So I think Maurizio, I saw you first, Richard, and Jean Pascal, and then we'll, all right, four, we'll do Oliver as well. Maurizio? Very short. Uh, Sorry, the, can you yeah, use, there's a microphone, and then can you introduce yeah. yourself? Your yeah, name Maurizio Martellini well, from uh, Insubra Center for International Security and Landau Network. Hello, Ambassador. A very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I am working with Zaria since many years, even if uh, my professional background is um, nuclear physics. And honestly, I don't see a sort of leapfrog. The discussion is trapped in, uh, let's say, in very important uh, issues, but very difficult uh, to communicate in a sort of public diplomacy. Now, if you ask me what has been the most uh, relevant result in the nuclear non-proliferation dialogue, allow me to use the dialogue, is the humanitarian initiative. What the humanitarian initiative teach, essentially, the fact that we need to bridge three issues that are always captured in different articles as you said, Ambassador, in different articles of BWC, namely, namely the global health. Second, the aging technology, the biotechnology to be used for illicit, malicious purpose. And then, of course, uh, the issues of uh, biosecurity. And uh, now there is another language attached to that. For me, it's very difficult to understand. We are speaking more and more on uh, biosecurity culture. Or... So I think uh, BWC must become a really living organism, as uh, Daniel said, but also able to adapt itself to this sort of cross-fertilization. And uh, so between health, uh, advanced aging technology, and uh, non-proliferation by non-proliferation. Of course, there are substantial issues, uh, like the compliance, I fully agree. But uh, uh, without uh, capturing, for me, the, uh, the human beings, I mean, the public opinion, I think it's quite difficult to make a breakthrough. So, and I would like to ask to this distinguished audience if uh, there exists any chance in the next... Uh, review conference to have uh, this sort of uh, intersectional dialogue b b between, among uh, topics, among issues, rather than, uh, let's say, chemical or biological. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maurizio. Um, Richard, next, uh, here at the front. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Richard Guthrie, CBW Events. Uh, a quick quick plug to start with for those who aren't following BWC too closely for each of the meetings uh, since 2006, been doing daily reports. If people uh, want details of them, feel free to come and have a chat. Um, I want to make a quick comment about the Russian proposal and have a sort of fairly broad question. I, I, the Russian proposal is very interesting because it's connected with one individual, um, on the Russian delegation, and it, it, it doesn't seem very clear to me um, sort of how much support there is uh, from the powers that be in Moscow. Um, I think they're, they're certainly giving support at the moment because it, it, it gives Russia a certain element of prestige in moving forward on issues, but it's not clear you know, whether this support would be substantial, say, over the coming five years, because there is a huge opportunity cost. There isn't much time in between review conferences to hold meetings, and obviously if there is some form of negotiation going on, there's a reduction in other intercessional activities, and so therefore that opportunity cost might be very severe if it doesn't produce uh, any um, tangible outcome. But the broad question I think I want to ask, I mean, some people... Some some of the comments from the panel have have touched upon this, but there's a, a there's a much bigger sort of broad question of what is success or failure uh, out of review conference. Um, if you can imagine, you're sitting in January nineteen uh, tw January twenty seventeen and sort of reflecting of what happened in November, possibly into December. It looks like November. 
what is it that you'd want to look back on to say that was a success and what is it you'd fear looking back on that would be a, a failure? Thank you, Richard. Now, um, Jean-Pascal, over by the wall. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pascal Sanders with the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris. Um, one question, uh, I think I'm going to put it specifically to Una since uh, she has... Uh, touched on uh, the compliance uh, issue. And um, one thing that uh, puzzles me, uh, states can uh, produce a number of reports uh, with the hope of uh, demonstrating their uh, compliance. But at uh, the same time, while doing this, uh, the state party actually decides under what provision of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention they want to demonstrate uh, compliance. Last summer, uh, during uh, the meeting of uh, experts, uh, the United States organized a side event uh, to explain the whole problem of uh, the anthrax that was uh, inadvertently shipped to Korea and uh, a range of countries uh, across the world. And the way uh, the United States uh, representatives and uh, experts uh, explained it all had to do was demonstrating compliance in the context of uh, Article 4, and they were uh, explaining the whole investigative uh, process, uh, the new measures in terms of uh, biosecurity, biosafety they were putting in place. The interesting part of the story was the uh, Russian representative made an intervention, and basically his questioning of U.S. compliance was under Article 1, of the convention, namely, why does the United States have to produce uh, so much uh, anthrax? Uh, why do they have to ship it uh, around to various uh, places uh, and so forth? So I don't want to get into the details of uh, that particular discussion. The point of uh, my question is, okay, if we are going to promote compliance further, how do we ensure that uh, the person reporting, well, the, the party reporting uh, compliance and the recipient hearing the message coming actually agree on uh, the provision, that part of the BTWC, uh, under which uh, the reporting and debate uh, takes place, because obviously the consequences are quite different. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pascal. Final question in, in this round, and then we'll throw it back to the panelists, is from Oliver Meyer, just behind you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver Meyer, German Institute for International and Security Affairs. I have uh, two more basic uh, questions. Uh, Una and I spent uh, Monday all day uh, at a meeting of the German CBW community and spent half day talking about the BWC and particularly the review conference. And there, were, there was a concern um, um, in, in two regards. One with regard to um, the BWC losing losing focus um, and this idea, as Ambassador Khan has said, that BWC meetings are there to come together to find every kind of biological danger. Um, there was a concern that the BWC was designed to prevent state-run programs in BWC and that this adding on additional functions has, um, has led to um, a, a loss of, of focus, uh, particularly given the background uh, or the, the difficulties that the OPCW, which has many more opportunities to address non-state actors, for example, even there, it's a big question and a big problem to get into into these kinds um, of issues. So I, I'd be interested in, in the panelists' views on, on this issue of whether the BWC should move back to the roots um, of, of where, where it started from and an assessment of this losing focus over the last... Um, 10, 10 or 15 years. And, th and the second related question is on, on process, of course, um, and um, the, um, the extreme version of the argument that we heard um, is that it's maybe better to have no intercessional process than to have a continuation of, of what we had over the last um, um, 10 years um, because there was very little added value. You can't take any decisions on, on the outcome of discussions and therefore this has certainly run its course, an argument we heard five years ago already um, and um, very little prospect of actually um, re reforming this process. So I'd also be interested in hearing view, your views on that. Is it actually, you know, has, has this run its course or is it worth uh, putting additional efforts in, in reforming and making this more worthwhile? Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. So um, now we'll pass back to the panelists and Ambassador Khan, if you're okay with going first, we'll go in the order of the speakers. Thank you. Well, I'll make some general observations. First is that, um, you know, as we move towards the next RevCon, uh, we should demonstrate a combination of realism and ambition because you can have many proposals, but if you do not manage your RevCon and PrepCon properly, uh, all your proposals could collapse. And there would be no consensus. So you have to invest in that process making, uh, to, to make it successful. The second point that uh, I want to make is that it's, it's, of course, it's sponsored by Rush, the Russian Federation, but it is not Russian proposal per se because it's an extrapolation of what was done back uh, till 2001. So it is that conventional wisdom that you have already on the table or which was a synthesis, a workable synthesis, um, developed by member states, but it collapsed because of the position taken by the United States at that time. But there have been changes in United States policies. Um, there were changes even in 2006. I mean, it was still the Bush administration, but there were changes, and now you have the Obama administration, and you have another year to go. Uh, so you, there'd be no surprises. There would be continuity in that context. There is um, differentiation that we have to make between compliance and verification. Compliance is possible and feasible, um, but uh, verification, I understand, is not doable because there was some sort of determination made years ago, and that determination stands in regard to verification. Uh, there were uh, Richard's question, uh, year 2017, and what, if looking back, what would be the successes? I would say that uh, expansion of the ISU, uh, <clears throat> some movement on compliance and Article 10, and uh, these should not be modest. I mean, the, the, the regime needs to keep on moving. And there were two other questions. Uh, should we move back to the roots? And I would say yes, yes, but that, that's not a minimalist agenda. There still would be quite a bit. And uh, I would support intercessional process. And I would say that if, if there is something, if there are deficits, we must redress them instead of discarding them. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank um... you. Hmm. If you, if you if you allow me, I'll, I'll start with Jean Pascal's question um, about the the question of, of, of compliance and who how to determine if they're basically talking about the same things or <coughs> drawing the same conclusions. I think um, just the the example you mentioned or the question you posed shows how important it is to have discussion discussions on that. I, I don't think it's possible to say now. This is compliance with Article 1, this is in compliance with Article 4, because um, these, are, these are norms and they're open to interpretation and all that, and that's exactly why I think we need some forum to, to discuss these things and not just discuss them once, but also to have an ongoing um, procedure, mechanism, forum, whatever you would like to call it, where these concerns could be addressed um, in, a, in, a, in a continuous manner. So whenever something comes up like that, there should be a forum available um, under Article 5 or whatever to, to say, okay, let's sit down, take someone who can, who can I don't know, chair the, the meeting, moderate, whatever, and, and discuss it and, and solve it, probably. I th like right now, that's the only way I, I see how to deal with these things because I think they, they would, if, if states' parties would get into that, they would keep coming up issues like that. Um, on the concerns of uh, the PwC losing focus, I think that that goes together with your question or your suggestion to, to or maybe maybe it doesn't go together, but it fits in with your question of um, how how the PwC could become more organic. Um, I was one of those who said I, there is a risk of the PwC losing focus if it becomes a forum in which too many related but not essentially 
contained aspects are discussed. So, of course, we cannot discuss BWC issues today without discussing health issues, but it shouldn't be a forum where global health is discussed because there are other forums for that. The BWC, I think, is a disarmament treaty and should remain a disarmament treaty. But, of course, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, so it ha the BWC community has to be aware of developments elsewhere, um, of scientific and technological developments, political developments, and all that. And there should be interaction, I agree with that, but still I think the focus should be on the security side and the, the, the health aspects um, should stay in the, in the WHO or other forums. Um, so I think it would be good no, well, the, not the political aspects, not the design, not the biological weapons aspects, but really just the, 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 I don't know, prevention of disease and what we what we have on the BWC or had on the BWC agenda too. Um, just to be clear, I'm not saying the BWC doesn't have anything to do with health. That's not what I'm saying. But I still think it's important to really focus what belongs in the security and what belongs in the health realm. Um, The question whether it's better to have an intercessional process, and I'll, I'll keep that brief, um, I think that, that connects with the question of success and failure, and I've started to scribble down a, a list, but I, I won't go through this. I think, um, basically, the, the biggest failure I can see would be a failure to preserve existing agreement on the content of the, the norms. Um, that sounds abstract, but I think it has practical relevance. So if we have a failure to... Um, reaffirm existing agreements in the final declaration, for example, on what the, what the core functions of the BWC are. I think that would be a failure. Whether it would be a failure or not to have to agree on, a, if, if there was no agreement on a new intercessional process, I think that really depends on what the intercessional process would look like. I would not like to see no interaction at all to the next review conference, but it should be um, real interaction, um, and it should be um, and I said that on Monday too, when we think back why the intercessional process was um, established in the first place was to reduce politicization, but if we, as we've heard now, there is a trend towards more politicization, so we'd have to redesign it to, to go back to the original function and not to have an additional forum where all political battles can be fought out, I think. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much, Una. And finally, John? And then we'll have another chance for some more questions. Thank you. So I'll just try to hit three main points. I suppose one is that some aspect of a review conference outcome should have operational relevance. So two suggestions here would be to try to transform the database um, principle or idea into something which is more highly desirable or consequential. So that would be moving towards greater operational relevance. And another would be to pursue the Benelux proposal to its natural political and technical endpoint, uh, at least as an exercise. And that could also perhaps change perceptions of political feasibility or desirability of what the regime should look like in future years. Second main point regarding the intercessional process, if one is to consider not having an intercessional process, then it would probably be worth having a special, different, fundamentally different political consultation process of a, of a fairly different nature. The political dynamic and level of engagement of this sort of process would be something fundamentally different from the lead-ups to the previous review conferences, and it's something which the treaty deserves, actually, if that is the thinking by uh, significant numbers of, let's say, in, within some capitals. Otherwise, uh, it's probably safer to um, go with the intercessional again. Third major point is just what the purpose of the regime is, one can have many discussions and different sorts of understandings of to what extent the regime should consist of capacity and understanding, the ability to understand and to discuss and to take some action based on changes in science and technology, for example. And the other would be perhaps more in terms of a framework for specific consultations and clarification. So to what extent can or should the f regime meet those two 
sorts of activities, and there has to be some sort of politically realistic balance between the two, and I have no particular special um, insight into how that should be done. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, now we can take a second round of questions. I would encourage all um, questioners to keep their questions, comments as, as brief as possible so that we get a chance to get through them, plus the comments from the panelists and perhaps even some more questions. I've got four already on the list now, starting off with Paul, Megan, Scott, Maurizio. And are there more people wrestling as well? Okay, so Paul Short, thank you. Thank you. One of the major problems with the BWC is it gets very little political attention. Um, there's little public understanding of, of the issues at play now. Are any of the proposals now in circulation likely to change that? Um, do, do you think any of them will, will get enough attention to turn into political pressure? And secondly, I think part of the problem, as in a way with the Chemical Weapons Convention, is that the process of verification is sort of or attempts at verification, are, are what mathematicians call asymptotic. You, the curve approaches the line of complete certainty about disarmament, but it never reaches it. And the closer you come to it, the more and more difficult it is to get more the necessary detail about the remaining uncertainties. Is, is that a natural, inevitable feature, or can it ever be overcome? And part of the problem may be the past. Uh, the ambassador mentioned the baggage of the past, Let's not mention the baggage of the past. I can think of at least two kinds of baggage, uh, and I'd be interested in, to know which kind he meant. But the problem is that if we discard the baggage of the past, it becomes, it becomes lost. The implications become lost. It was a long time ago, and besides, it never happened. And that, that's, that's something of the risk here, isn't it? We, we ignore examples of uncertain compliance because it, they happened, and it's not helpful to talk about them. But they don't go away in people's minds. Thank you, Paul. Um, Megan next, who's just behind there. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm Megan Palmer. I'm a senior research scholar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Um, I appreciate it, especially, Una, your, your comments on, on some of the perhaps um, more process-oriented questions about how do you make reporting easier, more structured, easier to to um, improve clarity and, and not just um, compliance. And, and also discussions around you know, what can be supported within the mandate of the, of the IS uh, in the implementation support unit and just overall expanding the number of people um, <laughs> focused on these issues. But I, I would hope you, um, I was wondering if you could disaggregate for me sort of three different limitations that, that you might be experiencing. Um, one, just on resources, right? The, the pure resources to improve the processes um, available. The second on, on the expertise of the people who can help to build those processes. And, and the third, really on whether or not it's, it's funda fundamental disagreements it exposes with respect to whether open or closed processes here make us more or less secure. Um, and and where do each of the th where's the primary limitation and where does that, where does that go? Okay, thank you, Megan. And then Scott, yeah, who's behind you. I think, well, I've had a few more people asking for the floor. So uh, if after Scott, we can come back to the panelists quickly for brief responses to those three questions. And then we'll take, um, we've got Maurizio, Veselin, and Frank after that. And then hopefully we can still finish by six o'clock unless. Does anyone else want to be added to the list while I've got? Nope. Okay, so Scott, please, you have the floor. And then back to the Thank you. I'm Scott Davis from the U.S. State Department, and thanks to the panel for three excellent presentations. Um, I wanted to quickly um, come back to the Russian proposal because uh, John had it right, but I think there's still a misunderstanding that the current Russian proposal includes verification elements. as It does not. So I hope everyone, many influ influential people in the BWC community here, and let's try to make sure that that's well understood. Their original the proposal they came up with uh, in the summer of 2014 did, but they have dropped that. So let's keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to, uh, oh, and I also wanted to comment on, on what John said. You, you made reference to the support for the Russian proposal. I think that um, in the beginning there was more support, specifically because it did include verification elements. I think that's waned because so many parties are interested in, in verification 
Uh, and, and the fact that the Russians have removed it from their proposal, I think, has reduced support for the proposal. Um, I wanted to ask Ambassador Khan um, his thoughts with regard to the informal part of preparing for the RevCon. Uh, we know there'll be one or two preparatory committee meetings next year. Obviously, there'll be a RevCon. We don't know how many weeks total and so on, um, all, all the formal process. But, of course, there will be informal processes starting from the chairman's and the president's consultations, um, interactions, other interactions in Geneva and so on. But there's talk, for example, of the possibility of regional conferences, perhaps in one or more of the developing country regions uh, of the world. Um, and, and maybe some other ideas that would be possible as well. So I'd just be curious if, uh, particularly given your experience with the BWC, whether you had any thoughts on what kind of informal uh, preparation, preparatory activities would be helpful to move us toward um, consensus. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Scott Wright. So if I can have brief reactions from, from the panelists, Ambassador Khan first. Thank you. First, about informal pr process or process of consultations. I think that the dynamics would have changed slightly by 2016 because last time in 2005, 2016, there was this uh, very palpable hostility between the United States and Iran, and they fought pitched battles during the PrepCom and the RevCom. So I think hopefully that would be out of the way. But when I uh, refer to informal consultations, what one needs to do and it's the responsibility of the president-designate to engage all important actors, uh, most of wh whom are present in Geneva. I mean, of course, capitals matter, but uh, most of the negotiator, the cast of negotiators, you'd find in Geneva. And if you can engage them productively, and if you can persuade them to send the right kind of messages back home, you start a process of consensus building. And this is very important because uh, I don't want to regale you on uh, regale you with the successes that we had <laughs> during 2006, but uh, it was a daunting challenge, as a matter of fact, because people were very angry. And when we were, I was talking about the baggage, I mean, there's good baggage and there's bad baggage, and there was bad baggage uh, because there were these interpersonal differences, and you had to somehow uh, work around them. Uh, to, to make this uh, uh, review, uh, review conference successful. Now, <clears throat> very quickly, a couple of points. I think that everybody is clear that I mean, the Russian proposal doesn't have an element of verification or suggestion for verification. And uh, one thing that I want to say very quickly, with your permission, Daniel, it is that when we're saying that uh, do away with intercessional process, we are forgetting that we have a very small secretariat um, within the disarmament establishment of the United Nations devoted to the BWC. We are saying, all of us saying, there are rapid developments taking place in the field of uh, uh, the biosciences and uh, biotechnology. And five years is a very long time. It is eternity. And, uh, I mean, if they, in the meantime, and there are these suggestions about... Uh, uh, adding to the agenda of compliance and coming up with some kind of monitoring mechanism. If you do that, you need a robust secretariat. Uh, at the moment, it is uh, um, very anemic. I mean, it, it can't... Uh, I, <laughs> you're not offended. <laughs> so I, I would say that we should have intercessional process and we should have a strong secretariat, not just... Uh, uh, adding the numbers, you must have A, the numbers, B, the expertise, and third, uh, resources. There was this question about what would get political attention, and I said three things would get political attention. Instantly, in Washington and uh, in Moscow, uh, among other capitals. But uh, these are compliance, of course, add to that verification. And the third is resources, resources slash ISU expansion of ISU. This would get political attention, but not the kind of attention that CWC gets or NPT gets. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Una, again, if I can encourage you to be as brief as yes. possible, please. Yes, on the question of uh, reaching reaching a, a sort of a, the top line of, of certainty about compliance, I don't think it's possible to, to ever be 100% certain, but I think it's a question of getting as close as possible to the line and certainly closer than we are now. 
Um, and I think in the BWC, a lot of what we talk about is, um, is preventive. It's not about current concerns, but it's to make sure that once they arise, we have something to deal with it. Um, the question on, on, on processes and resources and expertise, I think um, maybe it, I didn't make that quite clear, but what I, what, what I suggested with uh, sort of integrating all this reporting that's going on, there's not much new in there. Most of the reporting um, is going on anyway, so there are people who deal with it. The question is more to make it more accessible. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't really cost much more resources than uh, are required right now already. Thank you. John, as also as brief as possible, please. Thank you. Three basic clusters. The first is of the con on the compliance uh, question. So there are a couple of old, long-standing uh, discussions. One is whether you, if you have one treaty violation, if this undermines the viability of the treaty, as opposed to people who argue that the process overall and the engagement that's associated with it is what is important and that you move the parties that are sub-compliant or non-compliant towards, closer towards full compliance. And then there's the other point that you can never prove compliance 100%. You can only prove non-compliance. And even then, uh, one can imagine that common sense could be disputed. As for the Russian proposal, yes, I did take the 2014 um, proposal as the basis. Um, in the written statement I used 2014, I did not look at the subsequent iterations of it, and this is my fault. Thank you for the clarification. But you had it right on the fact that they dropped the compliance component. Right. There was some evolution, but I didn't take the time to read the fine print <laughs> due to lack of time. Maybe I shouldn't say that here, but <clears throat> in any case. Uh, the, the final point is the informal preparation. I think the short answer to that, my short answer to that, is that one simply has to have a facilitator or facilitators who have good sense and have a certain eminence and standing and a proper travel budget, and then they do what they do. You can't predict ahead of time exactly how that process works, but there are people who are very good at it. And one small side point is that actually, in some instances, a mark of a good facilitator is someone who understands what not to say and when it's important to limit the discussion. Because to move, move along a little further, diplomats, more often than not, specialize, among other things, in the sending and receiving of signals. And until there's a higher political instruction to move in a certain direction, there's a risk that the sending and receiving of signals will complicate matters because cross-linkage of issues is part of the normal practice. And so good facilitators sometimes can see how this operates in practice and perhaps limit some discussions in some circumstances. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's all context dependent. Okay. Great. Um, thank you very much, John. Um, very, very short amount of time left, but there's still three people that wanted to ask questions. So can I please ask that they're very, very brief questions or comments? And then we'll, we'll probably run a few minutes over. But Maurizio, you were first. Um, Sorry, microphone down here, please. And then um, Veselin and then Frank. Um, thank you, I'm Dr. Very Maurizio. short, please. Berbeski from WHO, but this comment is on my own, so not quoting it. Uh, first of all, Ambassador, if you say that the verification is not possible, is intrinsically, uh, scientifically in incorrect. It is possible as a matter of political will and how much the party wants to have it done. Verification was a banned word at the end of the protocol, but is uh, the interface between uh, medical sciences and uh, security has been so much uh, in evolution. In 2004, they said, why we need a protocol? A young New Zealand ambassador said in uh, Geneva, we have the international health regulations now. So I was taking the shoes and banging on the door, but I was wrong, and now the global health security agenda, there is a huge debate about the, the overlapping, if not substituting. 
Uh, I'm with Daniel, we need a bigger secretariat to do what? So if the scope is keep talking for five years, now, mo most of the capital, or most of you should say, what are we going to talk about? So what really, what Una said, are the content that would render this treaty unique? Otherwise, you'd better to keep it <laughs> as ancillary to others and have the debate outside this one. Uh, last comment, the quality of the level of the diplomats that are coming in Geneva for this debate is lower and lower. Ergo, the significance of the treaty and the result, trash in, trash out. So these are the three points that uh, possibly you can take as a stock to help your work, Daniel. Thank you, Maurizio. Veselin? Thank you. I, I will follow up uh, immediately uh, after the WHO, and we shall continue with... No. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, but, but, but we shall continue, continue this dialogue uh, outside the forum. I am Veselin Garvaro from NATO WMD Non-Proliferation Center, and I want to just to uh, press the point that we continue to value enormously the strategic value of the con convention, both as an arms control and non-proliferation mechanism. So very briefly, probably a question to you, uh, Daniel. Uh, sh should we expect some good news uh, on universalization by the review conference next year? Further good news, further to, to these years. Thank you. Okay, I'm Frank Meusen from the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, short comment. The intercessional um, process is, is one of the few institutions of this uh, very soberly institutionalized convention. So I think if you take it out, it, it should be replaced because replacing it by nothing is, is not an option in my view. The question, thank you, John, for mentioning the Benelux peer review. I'm interested, uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on your suggestions on, on how to proceed and turn it into uh, something the, the REFCOM can, can work with, but maybe we can also do it during the reception. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, I think we're going to have to pass some of this through offline conversations or conversations, like you said, over a drink, but I will very, very quickly let the, the panelists have the, the final word here as well. So again, Ambassador Khan. I'd say that uh, verification is technically feasible but not politically sustainable. So you can't deliver on it. That, that's what I meant. And we would uh, or we should try to improve the quality of diplomats who are turning up in Geneva. Okay, Una? No. <laughs> John? Uh, regarding the Benelux proposal, I think the only way that I might possibly make some small contribution is in writing. It's easier for me to phrase these things uh, rather than to speak ex extemporaneously. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Good answer, John. Thank you very much. Um, just, um, <laughs> Veselin, in terms of universalization, I mean, we've had two states that joined the BWC, um, Mauritania and Andorra, earlier this year. Um, we're hoping and Angola is very close. They joined the CWC um, the middle of September. Um, BWC was being considered by their, their national authorities at the same time as CWC, so we hope that BWC, um, they will join that very soon as well. Um, Cote d'Ivoire. The Council of Ministers in Cote d'Ivoire has fairly recently um, been considering the, the kind of the bill or the instrument for them to join. Um, Nepal was very close to joining, but then the earthquake earlier this year, I think, has set things back in Nepal. Um, so those are three which are fairly close. Any one of them might come along by the end of the year, but certainly I would hope that all three would be by the review conference next year. Um, with that, I, apologies if anyone felt rushed or anyone felt discouraged from asking a question because of the the time. It's, it's great that so many people did ask questions and there was such a good level of interest and um, good level of attendance here. So thank you all very much again for, for coming and for attending. We will all go down for a drink now, but first, before we do that, we should all thank the panellists very much. Thank you.